one of the areas that uh, Jax has paid special attention to is uh, disease of cancer, triple negative breast cancer. And one of our uh, star scientists is here today from uh, our campus down in Connecticut uh, who has been doing quite a bit of that research along with our CEO of Jackson Lab, Dr. Edison Liu, who is in addition to running the lab and the 2,200 employees and $335 million annual budget, also runs a principal investigator lab. And joining us today from his lab is um, one of our key researchers uh, in triple negative, tri triple negative breast cancer, Francesca Menji. So I'm gonna read you a little bit about her background and then I'm gonna invite her to come up to the front of the room and give her talk. So Francesca received her uh, Bachelor's of Science in Medical Biotechnology in Bioinformatics at the University of Milan, Italy in 2004 and respectively uh, uh, two degrees from uh, that institution and working on identifying genetic alterations that affect brain cancer patients' prognoses. She then pursued her PhD in cancer biology at the University College of London in the United Kingdom where she studied the transcriptional changes that occur during childhood brain cancer development. After graduating in 2010, she joined Dr. Ed Liu's lab at the Geno Genome Institute of Singapore as a postdoc fellow, studying the genome-wide patterns of genetic and transcriptional alterations that are implicated in the origins uh, and evolution of human cancer. In 2013, when Ed came to Jackson Lab, she followed Ed to the Jackson Lab at the, our genomic medicine campus in Farmington, Connecticut as an associate research scientist. With that, let me invite Francesca to the front. Good morning, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here today and to get to share some of the most recent research that our group, uh, mentored by Professor Edison Liu, has been carrying out over the past few years. So while I was preparing the DAX slide for today, I figured I really don't need to convince you that breast cancer is a very relevant disease and has in, uh, is incredibly impactful. I'm sure that all of us have been touched by this disease in one way or another, but just for the sake of some statistics, um, let me give you a few numbers. One in eight women in their lifetime will be affected by breast cancer. And um, in the US alone, 240,000 women each year, so including this year, will be diagnosed with invasive breast cancer. A thousand of these women are here in Maine. And 42,000 women die of breast cancer every year. So these numbers are incredibly um, sad. It's very overwhelming to see them. But despite this, we don't have to forget that we've made a lot of progress in the way we diagnose, prevent, and treat breast cancer over the past 15 or 60 years. And if we look at the five-year survival rate, which is the major milestone for a cancer patient, this has improved for 63% in the 60, all the way to almost 90% today. So th there is a lot of hope. We are doing things pretty well. And this major progress has been due to better diagnostic tools, early detection, like mammographs, of course, uh, better surgical um, uh, tools, but mostly the development of new drugs. And this development has stemmed from the understanding that breast cancer is not one disease. It's actually an heterogeneous group of tumors. They all originate in the mammary gland, but they're very different. And therefore, we need to address them differently. We need to understand what makes them such and develop treatments that are um, tailored for those specific cancer. And in fact, if we take a sample of 10 women diagnosed with breast cancer, Six of them will have um, cancer cells that are positive for the estrogen and or the progesterone receptors. And these women are currently treated with hormonal therapy. Two other women will have HER2 positive breast, ca breast cancers, and HER2 is a very fundamental molecule that is involved um, in the development of the normal mammary gland. But when it's activated too much, then it's a very potent oncogenic factor. So targeting the HER2 receptor on breast cancer cells has proven a very successful therapy for HER2 positive breast cancer patients. But unfortunately, we still have two out of the 10 women that diagnosed with what clinicians call the triple negative breast cancer. And as the name reveals, 
this is, we don't really know about it uh, very much. We simply know that it's negative for progesterone, estrogen, and HER2 receptors. So we're defining this type of cancer, but what it lacks, not really by what it is. So there's an enormous need of understanding the disease. And this is really important because this is a most aggressive form of cancer. It affects younger women, often premenopausal. So there's a lot of implication regarding fertility. And the currently only standard care for these patients is chemotherapy that is successful in some cases, but it's definitely not what we would like to see. We would like to see a treatment that really um, targets specific features of this tumor type. And so this is really the field where our laboratory wants to make a difference. And so a few years ago, uh, we decided to start looking at triple negative breast cancers. And you probably know, and you heard from Chad, cancer is this disease of a DNA. It really means that it derives from the progressive accumulation of changes in the DNA in specific cells in our body. In the case of breast cancer, these are the cells of the mammary gland. So in order to understand a little bit more about triple negative breast cancer, we look at the DNA of the cancer of over 250 triple negative breast cancer patients. And what we found was quite surprising. We found that in more than half of these cancers, there was a particular configuration in their genome. Um, these genomes were peppered with hundreds of tandem duplication of DNA segments. So what's a tandem duplication? Just like a tandem bike, where parts of a bicycle are repeated head to tail within the same structure. A tandem duplication is a segment of DNA that is copied and then reinserted in the genome adhesion to its original copy. Now imagine that this is not one event, but in the genomes of these patients, we found hundreds of these events, all scattered throughout the genome and chromosomes. So this is quite a complex uh, concept, and we kind of thought about it for a long time. And, um, I think we're at, at a point where we kind of understand how that uh, impacts the functionality of a cell. But before I try to visualize that at the DNA level, let me introduce a little analogy. This is a very simplified version, but sometimes it um, really helps to get the concept. So let's move into the baking field for a second. Um, imagine you want to bake a cake. You probably follow a recipe and have a list of ingredients and a list of instructions. And now imagine that you're trying to copy an old recipe from an old <coughs> recipe book, and you're trying to type it at the computer. And while you're typing, you're distracted. And every time you go back to typing, instead of starting where you left it off, you just go backwards a little bit, and you start copying words or sentences or fragments of sentences twice. So you end up with repetitions. And in this case, we repeated a whole line. So a whole ingredient is now there in double sizes. Or you could also uh, repeat just a small fragment of a sentence. And the final outcome is that the whole instruction is illegible. In this case, the baking instruction is completely legible. So you see how easily now this recipe became a recipe for disaster. So now let's go back to our DNA. And you know DNA contains all the information to make sure our cells work as they're supposed to do. And the basic unit of information is embedded in the gene. We have tens of thousands of genes in our genome, and they all have different functions, but we can broadly classify them into subgroups because they work in team to ensure that certain functions are taken care of. And in the cancer field, there's two groups of genes that we're incredibly um, interested in. The so first group of genes are what we call our gatekeepers or policemen of the DNA. They make sure that the cells behave as they should that they replicate when that's the time, that the DNA is intact, that mutations are taken care of and they're repaired. And we call these genes tumor suppressor genes because really their ultimate role is to avoid tumor growth. So I'm gonna just highlight some symbolic gene names here in blue. And then there's another class of genes that are equally important but they have the exact opposite function. And these genes tell the cells to grow to duplicate, to proliferate, to replicate their DNA. And you can imagine how relevant this function is because we need to grow taller. If there's a tissue damage, we need to repair it. So we need cells to really replicate in a very controlled manner. And we call these, um, in this case, I highlighted them in red here. So in a normal cell at a physiological state, there's a really fine balance between the activity of the red and of the blue genes. But now remember those duplications in the triple negative breast cancer genomes. Now, 
What we found is that duplication did not occur randomly throughout the genome, but they were localized in regions so that they would duplicate the red genes and disrupt the blue genes, just like they duplicated the sugar amount in our recipe and they disrupted the baking instruction. So you see that once we do this 100 times all around the genome, we have a complete unbalance now between the red and the blue gene activity that favors the red activity, so the pro-tumorogenic one. And this is how tumor initiates and progress. So this, um, it was an incredibly interesting finding because for the first time we started to understand, okay, triple negative breast cancer, you know, there's something going on there. There's something major in the DNA of these patients and we're starting to get there. But, you know, the question as scientists we always have to answer is, so what? Well, what do we do with it? Can we actually act upon it and improve, you know, the, the lifespan and the quality of lives of our patients? And in order to answer this question, we, we move into the mass models. And this is where JAX is incredibly successful, right? So there's a program that JAX has perfected over the past year is the mouse avatar of human cancer. Here we take a tumor sample from a cancer patient, either a biopsy or a surgical specimen, we cut it into pieces and we put it into mice that have uh, been modified, their immune system has been compromised so that they don't reject the human tumor. And then we let it grow and when it reaches a certain volume, we excise it from the mouse, we cut it in pieces and put it into more mice. And you can see how quickly we have a full cohort of mice. They all have the exact identical tumor that we found in the patient. But this is a wonderful tool because right now we can classify these mice, put them in groups and treat them with different treatment options and see which mice respond better than others. And so that's exactly what we did using tumors from triple negative breast can cancer patients that have all those duplication. And this is what we saw. This is a growth curve where we follow the tumor volume over time. And you see that if we don't um, add any drug, I'm trying to point it, but you'll see um, the tumor grows and it reaches at some point a volume that is not compatible with life. And if we add um, chemotherapy, we treat the mice with chemotherapy. These are two standard of care chemotherapeutic agents that are currently used for triple negative breast cancer patients. There is some effect because the tumor are not growing as fast as without drug, but really they're still growing a little bit. So this is not satisfactory. But what we found is if we use this platinum, which is a standard of care therapy that is used for other types of cancer, not triple negative right now, in these mice, there was a complete shrinkage of the tumor to undetectable level. And it's in the preclinical setting, we call this a cure. So this was very interesting and it kind of uh, excited us and it prone us to develop the new larger study. Um, and I'm gonna just describe that uh, with you. This is all ongoing. But the plan is to set up a mouse avatar clinical trial. So just like a clinical trial in the clinic, but instead of using real people, we're gonna use mice with real people tumors. But we also have the ability, because we can um, xenograft the tumor into several mice, to treat these mice with different treatments, up to 20 different treatment arms. So you can imagine this is gonna generate a whole um, massive amount of data that we're gonna analyze to associate the tumor genomic features with the response to specific drugs. And today I'm only gonna show you some really pilot data we generated just a few weeks ago. And uh, for comparison, I'll show you the results in a tumor that has all those duplications we talk about and a tumor that doesn't. And here we had um, in this first pilot study only eight treatment arms, but you can see, you can appreciate how different the growth curve ours. Um, so in the tumor with duplication, we had three different treatment options that seemed to work really well. In the tumor without duplication, we have a wide range of responses. Nothing is satisfactory at this time, but we have many more drugs to test, many more combinations. And so hopefully we'll be able to identify treatments that work for every type of tumor. And so I'm gonna leave you with the, our vision for personalized care for triple negative breast cancer where uh, women will be um, diagnosed with breast cancer, a biopsy will be taken, we can um, isolate DNA and analyze their genome and start stratifying them into subgroup of patients, each one will be benefiting for a specific treatment. And so hopefully this is where we're gonna be in, in a short time. 
And on these notes, I'm gonna conclude my talk. And thank you so much for your interest in this topic. And I'm happy to take questions. I don't know whether there'll be a separate session in a while. Thank you.